The American Pet Products Association found that there are 90 million dogs and 60 million households in the United States alone. Another interesting statistic found that people born between the years of 1980 and 1994 make up 35% of the total pet owners, and 43% say they want a pet in the future. Jim Watson of the North American Police Work Dog Association stated that there are roughly 50,000 dogs working for police and there are about 2,500 in active military service. Finally, there are roughly 500,000 service dogs helping Americans with disabilities. It's safe to say that dogs are a fairly large part of our society and aren't going anywhere anytime soon. But where do dogs come from? Let's go back to the beginning and be warned, this episode will feature many pictures of adorable dogs. Join me as we learn something new. All dogs are descended from wolves. The gray wolf and the dog split off from a now extinct wolf species anywhere from 15,000 to 40,000 years ago. Less clear, however, is the location where dogs began to interact with humans. Genetic studies place them anywhere from China to Europe. Some scientists theorized that dogs were domesticated several times throughout history in different locations, completely uninfluenced by other domestication instances. The prevailing theory today is that dogs originated in Asia, with genomes pointing to the domestication happening at least 14,000 years ago. Then, between 14,000 and 6,400 years ago, different breeds began to emerge moving towards Eurasia. However, there are dog fossils older than this in Europe, suggesting that there were domestications happening that were ultimately unsuccessful or unsustainable until the breeds from Asia came to the area. So how exactly did early humans domesticate dogs? The old theory was that groups of hunters stumbled across a litter of wolf puppies and raised them to be with humans. However, this theory has lost value in the scientific community, instead being replaced with the survival of the friendliest theory. This theory is almost completely opposite from Darwin's survival of the fittest theory, where Darwin's theory favors those animals that were bigger, stronger, and faster than all the other animals, allowing them to reproduce and pass down their traits, the survival of the friendliest theory states that the dogs who were willing to get close to humans and pick up on their social cues were able to share in the food that the humans gathered. Then, the humans began to offer protection to those dogs that were friendly and helpful to them. As these friendlier dogs bred under the human's care, they acquired physical changes such as curly tails and floppier ears. This was studied in a Russian experiment created by Dmitry K. Belyev using wild foxes. When the foxes were more willing to approach humans and then bred, successive generations became better at recognizing social cues like locating an object based on hand gestures. Although early humans may not have intentionally bred dogs in this similar way, they did everything that was necessary to produce the domesticated and tameable animals we see today. Getting even deeper into the science behind the domestication of dogs, geneticists have discovered a portion of the DNA in dogs that is disrupted, giving them friendlier behaviors. Wolves have this part of their DNA still intact, which explains why they are still aggressive and untrusting towards humans. In fact, if this area of DNA is disrupted in humans, it causes Williams-Buren syndrome, a condition which is characterized by extremely friendly, outgoing, and trusting traits. Dogs served as companions to ancient humans, but they were also taken on hunting excursions and used for camp protection. The ancient Greeks even thought of dogs as geniuses among animals, with Plato claiming that dogs were lovers of learning, and Diogenes saying that people should emulate a lifestyle of simplicity on the level of the dog. Dogs vary much more now from the wolves they initially descended from. Originally, they were fierce pack animals similar to wolves. Over time, throughout their domestication, however, they became better at interacting with humans and worse at working together with their own species. Pack mentality and behaviors are greatly reduced now, causing them to become much more reliant on humans. An example of this comes from an experiment where wolves were tested against dogs. They were put in separate rooms and given a box that was impossible to open. The wolves use a trial and error system of different techniques to try and get the box open, while the dogs struggled with it for a very short time period before going over to the human to ask for help. 
Another huge change in how dogs interact with humans is the chemical responses that humans have on dogs as well as dogs having on humans. When dogs make eye contact with humans, both species' brains release oxytocin. This is a hormone that elicits trust building and bonding, often seen between parent and child or between mates. The dog-human release is one of the only cases where this happens in sync between species. The first of the modern uses for dogs are, of course, as pets. Dogs are the lovable companions for many. They are caring additions to the family that have social capabilities to love and be loved, allowing them to make for great pets. Service dogs help people with disabilities accomplish everyday tasks or guide those who are blind. They can help with retrieving items, opening and closing doors, turning on and off the lights, putting items on countertops, and so much more. There are also therapy dogs that are meant to provide happiness to those in elderly care homes or in hospitals, as well as providing help to those suffering from PTSD, anxiety, seizures, and depression. This is one of the most varied areas dogs work in. Dogs can also work in a police capacity. The most popular role of police dogs is the suspect apprehension role. The dogs are trained to chase after dangerous suspects and bite them, holding them hostage until the police can catch up. This role is almost exclusively reserved for extremely intelligent dog breeds, who can be trained on which people to bite upon the order of their handler. They tend to be descended from the herding breeds, such as Belgian Malinois, German Shepherd, and Dutch Shepherd. They can also work in detection and search and rescue roles. Guard dogs help protect public or private property, standing guard often throughout the night, keeping a watchful eye over the people and the property. SAR dogs, or search and rescue dogs, help crews find and rescue people. This could mean anything from a person who went hiking in the woods and got lost, helping find loved ones after a natural disaster or a building collapse, or avalanche dogs that help rescue survivors buried in the snow. There are even certain areas that employ dogs with an aptitude for finding body parts. They call them cadaver dogs. They find the dead body or body parts of someone even if they are buried, hidden, or submerged. Hunting dogs assist hunters in finding, tracking, and retrieving wild game. There are hounding dogs and gun dogs. The running hounds are meant to flush out the hunter's prey. They circle behind the animals, typically rabbit, deer, or boar, and push them within shooting distance of the hunter. Gun dogs, also called retrievers, sit next to the hunter while they are looking for an animal, and once they down an animal, they, the dog will go out over land or in water to retrieve the prey, usually a bird. Dogs have been used in a herding capacity for a very long time. They are able to guide sheep, cattle, and other farm animals from area to area and are even useful as protection, guarding over the animals and keeping them safe from any predators that might be nearby. Detection dogs can help sniff out the chemical components found in bombs, or in other case, drugs. These dogs are often used in a police capacity, or used at airports. Now for one of the most interesting jobs that dogs can perform, cancer detection dogs. These are dogs with the ability to sniff out certain kinds of diseases in cancer. Cancerous cells can produce a very specific odor, and dogs can be trained to sniff the difference between healthy cells and cancerous ones. It takes around eight months to train them, teaching them with samples of plasma, urine, and saliva. The dogs can become so good at sniffing out cancer, they can even smell it with as little as someone's breath. They can be trained in similar ways to help detect diabetes as well. Dogs are amazing. They have been designed almost from our first interactions with them to be man's best friend. They are the product of accidental and intentional societal training, domestication, and selective breeding to become the best animal companion for humans. What's your favorite dog breed and how many dogs do you have? Or how many dogs do you want? Let's talk about it down in the comments below. Thanks again for watching another episode of Learn Something New. Please consider liking and subscribing.